Uh, Jeff over at Talent Reach, working with people smarter than me. Today, I'm uh, very pleased to be joined by Jake Wolpert from AccuCo. Hi, Jake. Hey, Jeff. Really appreciate and, uh, having me. Yeah, yeah. No, this is this is really great. I appreciate you coming on. So, uh, the goal of this is to is to sort of help hiring managers, sales leaders navigate some of the things that we might be seeing in your world by interviewing people like Jake, who are, are you know sales directors, CROs, who, who really understand uh, a very specific. Uh, goal and, and tranche of, of knowledge that might not be apparent. My role is I sit in the middle of tech sales and hiring at, at Talent Reach. I'm a, I'm a sales, sales talent advisor, which just means I help teams, hiring managers figure out how to weed out the B players to so they can grow their teams, whatever it, that B player means to them. Uh, most of the time, it's, it's just sort of getting them past wading through thousands of resumes, especially in today's hiring market. And then offering some sort of guarantees that we're going to deliver what we say we're going to. And that way, the back end of that is the is the retention part of hiring, which we find is a lot of times uh, challenging. So my goal here is to spend the next hour talking to you and, and figuring out what you know that everybody can can uh, benefit from. No pressure. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Give me give us the 30 seconds of, of you know, who you are and, and, and what you do. Akiko is sort of you know mission statement, things like that please pitch anything that you're working on or you want people to know about. I want to make sure that we're getting as much promotion as we can for those of you who spend your morning hours with me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, Jeff, thank you for having me on. I'm really excited uh, to be here and hopefully I could uh, share as much wisdom as possible over the hour. Uh, but a little bit about me, I'm a builder. I build sales teams, sales process infrastructure. I like the chaos. I like joining companies in their infancy, uh, helping people put people in the right seats. Um, I like the idea of having a mess and making sense of it. Um, so I've, I've done that in the Amazon space specifically in the last over the last six years. Um, and I joined AccuCo uh, about a year and a half ago. And, you know, they were looking to build out their sales process. AccuCo buys uh, Amazon third party sellers. So we acquire Amazon businesses that are, you know, at the top of their uh, categories uh, usually Amazon sellers are really good at building businesses to a certain point. We like to buy them at that point where we think we could take them to the next level. Um, so we have had pretty good success over the last year. I'm really proud of uh, at AccuCo. I'm in charge of helping target and identify and target these Amazon sellers that would fit nicely into our portfolio, complement um, you know, our collection of brands and that we see potential in, in, in taking, uh, you know, but basically, you know, as far as we can on Amazon and then beyond. So omni-channel strategy as well. Give me an example of a type of company that, I mean, I realize it probably runs a wide gamut, but like what's, give me an example, like selling what? So uh, one of our most proud acquisitions is Lux Club. Uh, they sell bed sheets, um, yeah. really nice quality bed sheets on Amazon. They have hundreds of thousands of reviews. So it's a really good product for Amazon, and we can get them into Target or Bed Bath and Beyond or Costco um, and scale them beyond Amazon and then internationally as well. I got it. So they're starting on Amazon, but you offer them a much wider, or you bring them in, you acquire them to to then expand them into other marketplaces they didn't have access to. That's right. Um, you know, Amazon sellers are usually good at scaling their business. Uh, to let's just say 10 million, right? Uh, they're really good at that. And what they realize is the same things that I did to get here are not the same things that I, you know, have to do to get to the next level. So I may have to hire a team. I may have to, you know, expand my catalog. I may have to double down in advertising, uh, order more inventory. And those challenges are a lot different than they had when they first started. Uh, so we offer them an opportunity to exit. We take over their business. We can scale it while they can continue to potentially, you know, earn you know, uh, for the next two years and then they can retire on a beach somewhere or they can start another <laughs> business, really wh whatever they want to do. Um, we let, let them exit, you know, exactly how they imagined. And do you have a, a, a strategy in terms of what goes into that portfolio? Is it yeah focused on bed sheets or is it a wide omnivorous approach? Right. So we look at uh, categories like home and kitchen, for example, is, is a really good one for us. But we're category agnostic in that we, above all, we want top performing brands that we see opportunity to scale as far as we can on Amazon and beyond. Um, so we look at categories differently. We actually look at a, about 125 data points. We're really proud of our lead scoring, you know, model. Um, and then the, you know, the experience that we have with our brand owners, or I mean, our, our brand managers, 
you know, their ability to scale brands that, you know, complement our current portfolio. Interesting. And I want to definitely uh, switch in a second over talking about the current marketplace and, and sure. you know, dig into some of this, this tech sales hiring. But what you just said was interesting. Are you ha- are you seeing challenges in current marketplace with supply chain issues Does that influence your decisions? What's happening yeah. on the ground in that space? Yeah, it's a good question. So everybody is facing supply chain issues. I can't sit here and say like, you know, as a company that owns 40 Amazon brands, we're not getting hit by rising yeah. costs as well. Although supply chain... Uh, or the, the cost for containers, for example, has started to uh, come down a little bit. But what helps us is we have local procurement teams in Asia that help us along the way. So I think the costs and the you know the long delays are easier to navigate when you have specific expertise and playbooks to operate uh, you know the supply chain, right? Uh, the supply chain side of Amazon. Got it. And, and so there's there's no real. Oh, we, we're going to go after this business because the supply chain woes are are, are lessened in that area. It doesn't really affect the no, mass. No, not, not as much. No. Good. So that gives you some, you know, super runway. Awesome. Anything in particular you're working on you want to talk about and like focus on, want people to know about personally or professionally? Uh, my mission is to build world-class sales teams. I do that um, by empowering people. In the interview process and the onboarding, I'm really proud of that. Um, I think that's why I was put on this planet to really empower people and challenge them to think bigger. Um, the vehicle that I did that is the application is sales. Um, but I'm really proud of my leadership over the last seven years and being able to put people in the right seats. Okay, there's a lot. There's a lot there right there because um, yeah. you know I, I I you'd think we could agree. Everybody would say, oh yeah, I'm here to like make sure I build the best possible team. So. Start big. What is what does the best possible team look like? And I realize you know it's going to look different for each and every company, right? That's why I only talk about A and B players, which is a bit unfair sure. when you think about it abstractly. But everybody's got their ideal. So how do you, how give me a couple like key things you're looking for that you do? What's happening? You know, in on the ground with um with hiring sales, go to market roles. I'm assuming you're in charge of all that. Yeah. So uh, just to take a step back, I like to build really lean teams, right? Okay. So small teams, powerful teams. I want people that want to be directly responsible for the success of the company, right? No one's sitting on the sidelines. I don't want to build a team where I have really, you know, three really solid, you know, over 120% and then a bunch of people at 70%, but it averages out to 100. That's no good for me. So when I hire, I'm really particular about somebody that I think really wants to be that star. They don't want to just blend in. Um, And so I think I've had success in the past because I can build small teams that are really powerful. Uh, And and that's, that's my biggest goal. Uh, I like, I like to always be at the startups and not to operate a company that has, you know, 400 salespeople and directors and managers. I like to really be in with the team um, as close, you know, as possible. All right. So again, I, I, everybody would say, yeah, absolutely. We want everybody hitting quota or, or a little yeah. bit over as opposed to one or two power sellers. How, what's some of the, start with the, start with the way that you, you, you pitch working for you, like the okay. job descriptions front of, front, front of the funnel for hiring. Okay. So that, that's, I'm glad you said that, right? They don't work for me. I work for them. Right. And okay. so I start every single interview, every single one I do. And I'm usually the first call of the okay. interview. I start every single one by telling people that 50% of this interview is going to be me proving why I should, why I'm a good fit, why I'm a good sales leader and why, you know, you should feel encouraged that I'm going to support you. And the other 50% will be you trying to prove why, you know, you'd be a good fit and you can make an impact here. It immediately takes pressure off people because usually they come in, they think it's going to be an interrogation, right? Right. Like, I'm going to ask you like, why would you be a good fit here? Like, tell me about like your quota, you know, history. Uh, you know, and, and people don't like that. And so they give you these B- BS answers, like I'm um, the hardest worker, I show up at eight o'clock in the morning and, you know, and then the, you really just get it, especially in sales, you're just getting somebody who's good at pitching themselves, right? Yeah. Uh, when I say that, it immediately takes the edge off. And then I, the second thing I do in every single interview is I say, what questions do you have for me? Start the interview that way. And so I can really get an idea of like what they're interested in, what they're curious about. If they say something like, uh, how much money can I make? Or how quickly they get promoted? Or what is the company going to be like in five years? 
I know that they probably haven't prepared and also they're focused on the wrong things. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if they say to me things like, how are you going to support me? Uh, What does the most successful person do to make them successful? What is the hardest part of this job? I can tell that they, what they're interested in, what they're going to focus on um, and what's most important to them to have success. So there's, there's an element there where a veteran seller is going to know to ask some of those questions and ask them naturally. So, you know, they're not just repeating a, a script, right? Yeah. What about when you're, I mean, hiring a, an entry level, an SDR, ISR, you know, AE, who might not have the same experience. What else can you pick up on? I mean, I'm assuming you've got some questions that draw them out a little bit to get past the, uh, I, I just, you know, this looked like a great job and you were a great company and I can make some money. Yeah. So I mostly hire uh, entry level salespeople. Okay. Actually. I, I'm, I very rarely hire the like the traditionally experienced account executive that has been doing this for 10 years. In fact, when I speak with those sellers right off the bat, I, I tell it, like, listen, you're, you're too qualified for what I'm looking for. And then we pivot and I, I try to help them find a job somewhere else because I, I do get a lot of people um, reaching out to me on LinkedIn and, you know, they see that we're hiring and, but anyway, for the entry level salespeople, um, I think that first part when I tell them that 50% is on me, I think that allows them to really have a, a conversation. And usually you don't, like you said, you, you don't get the most polished answers. Um, yeah. But I still think that they are, they do prepare for, for interviews. They, they'll ask me something specific about AccuCo or they'll say like, hey, I saw you on a podcast, right? Or I saw this and they'll ask me, and that tells me that they've at least done some research. They've you know, they're, they're able to articulate like what's interesting about Akiko or the Amazon space. And then we can kind of talk from there and, and, and we can go into what's really interesting to you about this. Like, how did you come across this? Um, and, and I mean, I, 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 table stakes, right. It's like, if you're, if you're even going to get into this interview, you better have done a little bit of research. Yeah. I had a call yeah. yesterday, right. I had a call yesterday with somebody and I said, you know, what, what's most interesting about Akiko? And they're like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. And I was like, well, do you know anything about IQ? Like, no. Right. Like, well, like, well, why did you take this call? And like, well, cause you guys, you know, you're looking for account executives. It's like, okay, well, and I gave him some feedback and we moved on. But right. um, if you, you know, if you're entry level and you're looking to get your first sales job, I'm more than happy to give you a shot. Right. But you got to tell me something. You have to tell me like, what are you going to be the best at? Or, you know, how do you go about, you know, getting good at things? Um, and so if they don't have a lot of sales experience or they don't know about Amazon or, you know, whatever, we can talk about something in their personal life, right? Like, what are you really excited about? Right. What's, what's something that you're proud that you're an expert in? How did you become an expert in that? And those are things that, you know, we could talk about. Um, usually I'll know enough about whatever they're talking about where I can, you know, ask them more pointed questions, but. Um, what tells you a lot about who they are, I guess, if someone's going to show up for a job interview and not have done any research, Right. Right yeah. out of the gates. It's it's a it's a mindset sure. you know, qualifier, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. But those ones are easy to get rid of. The, the hard part is the ones who do the research. <laughs> right. And they come in and they know about me. Right. They've, you know, read some of my LinkedIn posts or they've like, you know, learned about me in some way. You know, they've looked on the website and because that, that, that's like the top, you know, 20 percent. But I can't hire the top 20 percent. I can sometimes only hire one person from that. Right. Top 20. And then I have to sift through, um, you know, uh, luckily I have more rounds of the interview. But, you know, I'm, I, I also I, I just want to say that when I look at a, a resume or I, I interview somebody, my mindset is what would make them successful rather than how can I DQ this person as quick as possible? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Think like look, looking at resumes, usually people are like, what's something I could immediately, you know, just throw this resume in the garbage. And I, I look at it like what's something I can pull out here that there's some potential. There's something that interesting about it. And maybe I can move them on to the next round. Um, because I actually do like looking at resumes. It's a time suck, but it's, it's worth it if you want to hire the best people. Well, I was going to say you hear, um, you know, obviously in my world in recruiting, it's like, Oh, well, did you, you know, make sure you do your homework, make sure you understand why the company is a good fit for you, which, you know, why you're excited to work there things that's sort of basic, but how much, how much of that research do you do on candidates? A lot. That's why I was really <laughs> pissed when this guy didn't know anything about, because I, I went through his resume, I went through his LinkedIn, I, I had some questions to ask him. <laughs> uh, you know, like I said, like I, like 50% of the interview is I'm responsible for. Yeah. So I take it really seriously. And, I um, you know, when they come in and they say, like, how much money can I make? Or 
how many cold calls I have to make. Like, come on, like you have such an opportunity here. Like there's like we can like at the very least, if I don't think you're a fit, I, I will. If you if you really bring it, I'm, I'll try my hardest to maybe point you in the right direction. But yeah, uh, yeah. you know what are you gonna do? That's, it, yeah, certainly happens. So all right, so then you, you so, so once you get to that past that point, you find your uh, you find your your whatever defines your A players, right? The other big thing that um, I like to sort of understand is talk about retention, which starts in the interview, right? I feel like you gotta, you're got you building with the right person. You're building good rapport. You're like really building trust with the idea that you're part of this conversation. Right. So talk me through like the next part of that that hiring funnel, like on, the onboarding, the the ramp, the, the retention okay, yeah. uh, efforts that you make. Yeah. Okay. So this is what I'm the most proud of. I, I am proud of finding candidates, but I do think that you don't hire a players, you develop them. And I, okay. and I feel, I, like I felt really strongly about that. So onboarding, I believe that onboarding is the most important part. It's the best opportunity to start the retention process. So from day one, I build a development plan for them. So I want to know that, you know, it's an agreement. It's if you do these things and I do these things, you know, you could get to the next level. We don't define what the next level and there's not a time frame, but you know, it's not that I'm committed to help you get to the next level. Right. The other part is the onboarding is done by everybody on the growth team, specifically in Akiko. So you meet with everybody on the team uh, you get additional perspective. And mo more importantly, you learn that like everyone's in it together, right? These are the people that are going to help, help you support. And that's why just to take a step back, the interview process you're interviewed by people who are doing the role currently, right? Because mm -hmm. they, they want to size you up, make sure that, hey, we're, we're going to do everything we can to help you get up and running. Are you going to appreciate that? Are you going to take this seriously, right? So by the time you get on board, you are you're meeting with people on the team and we're really building that culture of whatever questions you have, people have been there before, you can ask them, right? They're going to support you. Um, it's going to be a friendly competition, right? They want to, they want to beat you, but at the same time, like we all want to be a hundred percent and you know, one person's 101%. Um, the other part is I'm very involved in the onboarding because some people come in with sales experience, but no Amazon experience. Some people come in with Amazon experience, no sales experience. So I, if I really tailor that onboarding to the individual. I think they appreciate that. And, you know, I meet with them. Uh, I, th this is overboard. And I know that I know this is not scalable, but I, for three weeks, I meet with the new reps every morning for 30 minutes and at the end of the day for 30 minutes. And I do that for three weeks. And it's a lot. It takes a lot of time to do that. Yeah. But it, it works. It's an investment. Uh, and, you know, the, the proof is people can grow uh, and produce really fast. Um, and more than anything, it's not me just saying, Hey, I'm going to support you, or this is going to be good. I'm, I'm literally proving that right off the bat. Uh, so yeah. I, I want a big, my big soapbox is, is demonstration of things you say. It's, it's easy to say stuff. Yeah, exactly. How, how are you, how are you putting that in practice? Uh, that sounds amazing. So then your, uh, retention rates must be very high. Retention rates are high, but what I'm the most proud of is that, yeah, you know, well, I'm not proud of this, but if people leave the team uh, eventually for whatever reason, or I, I leave the company, um, old reps that I've hired still call me, and you know sometimes they ask me to mentor them. Yep. And I think the best title that you can have as a, as a sales leader is mentor, uh, because you don't apply for it, you don't get promoted. Somebody you know chooses you, yeah. And and I think that's a good indicator that the systems that I've built work. Um, yeah, retention is good, but you know, for whatever reason, sometimes people leave companies well, and they move on. Let's talk a little bit about what's happening in our current you know space because it's a it's unique and uh, scary. <laughs> so I would be shocked if you hadn't had a lot of churn over the past you know I mean two years, sure, but talk about the last six months and where we're headed in the next six months. Yeah, scary. Um, yeah. I, I want to be tough and, you know, say like, oh, we're all good, but it is scary. I mean, I have a mortgage, I got wife and kids. And so I would be lying if I said that I wasn't you know, a little uh, scared about where we're at and what the future is going to be like. There's a lot of uncertainty. You go on LinkedIn every day and you see companies you know, layoffs and um, people looking for jobs and, you know, you see the open to work banners. So, yeah, it sucks. I think what's going on is, is really challenging. 
Um, but I do, I am optimistic about the next six months. I, I see, I try to keep my network as strong as possible. And so people will message me, Hey, I'm looking for people or, you know, do you know any salespeople or do you know any uh, market? So I, I do think if you can sift through like all the negativity, you can see some optimism. Companies are hiring. Um, companies are forced, right. To, to operate better. And I, so I think that it, it does suck that what we what we have to go through, but I think the end result will be stronger companies, better leadership um, and better opportunities. And, and I think, you know, good pay as well. Well, yeah, I, I see that. That's good. Do you think that there's uh, much to the news making it, making the most of layoffs? Because obviously it's newsworthy. There are lots of layoffs. You like yeah. go to the layoff tracker and you can see numbers, even though, you know, and it's mostly startups and stuff. But when you go to LinkedIn and you and you look for open positions, which again has its delta in terms of what's real and what's not, right. but you're on the ground for that. You're probably have you know people that you've posted to to hire. I mean, are those jobs really hiring? Is the gap smaller than it seems, or are we seeing something that is 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 unique and rare and terrifying that has never happened in the history of history of business? Well, I don't, I don't know. So I, well, like 2008 was my first year out of college and, um, and that was, that was pretty bad, but, um, so that, that's, uh, that's <laughs> the close work comparison. Work. <laughs> yeah. That's close <laughs> comparison I have. Um, you know, I was like forced to get three jobs, three part-time jobs just to make it work. Um, and so I, I see this is like that, but I do see companies, I, I think there are companies that are really hiring and those are the ones that have over the last couple of years been operating you know properly I, I think it's hard to find them just from job postings and that's why i think having a network even if you're not looking for a job even if you're um you know you, you feel good about your current company um or you feel some job security you should really establish that network i think that's where the best jobs come from is knowing somebody or uh you know being connected to somebody who's connected to somebody that's looking for a, a role but if you just look at, you know, job postings, you know, yeah, I think there's some fluff there. I think companies just say that they're hiring for, you know, marketing purposes. Um, so, but I, I think like you got to sift through and you have to meet people. And, um, and I also think people will hire, even if they're not like looking, they'll hire somebody who's an expert and who can specifically make an impact in their company. You know, everybody's always looking for somebody who's a spark or somebody who's going to come in in the sales capacity and bring in revenue right away. Seems right now is an incredible time to hire because there's so many people who are really at the top of their game. Yeah. That are either available or, you know, would be willing to move for the right thing. Are you seeing, are, are you guys, are you seeing other companies take advantage of that? I mean, my, my prediction is that in, in a year, this will be the moment where people say, yeah, I missed it. I should have been hiring, maybe not a lot, right? I don't hire dozens and dozens of people, but I also think, you know, the people who successfully do it now are going to be in a year, like in a, in a incredibly sweet position. Thoughts? I agree with you. I, I think that prediction is, uh, is dead on it. I mean, I talk to candidates all the time that are more qualified than what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm, and I tell them like, you know, you know, throw, put a couple more hooks in the water and you're going to get like an amazing, like a company will be really like, Two people last week, I, I, a guy named KJ and a guy named Riley, I spoke with them. I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe how, like, powerful these salespeople are. Mm -hmm. Like, polished, like, good experience. Um, they knew exactly, like, what they did to be successful. So I agree with you. I think there's a lot of really solid candidates. I would have hired both of them. They were just – I needed, like, the, the version of them from, like, 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I agree. I think there's a lot of candidates out there. And, and people sometimes, like – uh, who are not like public about looking for jobs will, will message me and, you know, see if, you know, I know if anything, uh, man, this, like, if you threw your open org banner on, or you kind of made it public, like you get a job in a second. And I agree that the companies that act on this are going to get the best, I mean, not just sales people, but just the, the best uh, yeah. em employees and like, you know, call them the, the, the A plus play, the star players. Yeah. So the, that's my next thought when there is, is that what is it that keeps, look, you know, CEOs, CROs, people who are leading these, these startups, teams are, are smart. 
right? They're savvy. They, they know how to run a good business for the most part. What's keeping them from taking advantage of this moment? What's the, where's the fear coming from? Uh, their fear is coming from, um, well, it depends. I think a lot of times the fear I mean, is there's, a lot to pick, there's a lot to choose from in that menu, I realize. Right. But. <laughs> yeah. So I think the fear is coming from making the wrong hire. Okay. And I think the biggest uh, issue I have with people um, not hiring or, you know, like hiring or making wrong hires is they're looking for the perfect candidate. They're looking for because they, they can't miss. And so if they hire somebody with like perfect experience and the person doesn't work out, it covers their ass, right? Like, hey, look, I, you know, this person was perfect. And I think what that shows is that they're not as confident in their ability or mm-hmm. that they haven't built a, a process or, a, you know, enablement program that could support that. So they just want to hire like the perfect candidate that you can just drop in. Doesn't, you don't have to worry about anything. That person's going to have success. And so let me let me interrupt real quick. I don't, I don't want to lose that train of thought, but I think this is really important. What resources do people like you have to improve that process? Like, where do you go? What, what, how did you learn to have more confidence without trying to check every single box on a, you know, long bulleted job description? Um, you, you, you can't like necessarily start. It's a, I think it's, it's the idea of like, it's okay to be wrong. Uh, it's okay to be, you know, vulnerable and admit, you don't have that. I think you, you don't put all the pressure on yourself. You have you, the team does it. So you, know, you have people on your team that are helping with onboarding. You have people on different teams that are helping. And if you think like you're going to do it on your own, you're going to build this thing, you know, this, this whole uh, enablement system on your own, you're not going to do it. So you have to put people in the right seats. You have to empower them. And, and then you can kind of st- take a step back and you can build this, uh, you know, this team, this community that's going to empower each other. I think that's the key. Um, and I, and I just think that a lot of, a lot of sales leaders, especially have big egos and they're like, I'm going to do no, it. No, not so, sales. Yeah, I do. I, I do. I still have an ego, but um, I mean, I, you know, I, I think I've, I've grown a lot um, as a sales leader the last 10 years and I, and I really feel confident where I'm at now that I don't know. I don't know everything. I, I don't need to, but I'm really good at, knowing where my expertise ends and where I can go to get the expertise that I need. I, I think that allows that's, me to be successful. Yeah, I think that that's an interesting, that's a great element in reducing some of that fear and, and clinging to the, the need to make the right decision. Um, and, and I want to talk to some about the other factors you're seeing in the, in the marketplace. But again, got a resource, a book, a podcast, something that inspired you to get over some of those some of those fears to, to uh, let yeah. go a little bit? Yeah. Okay. So books. So the culture code uh, okay. by Daniel Coyle is uh, one of my favorite books. Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek. I think is really powerful. Um, those are two books that I like. Gold, I, yeah. I, I love those two books. Uh, I, but I do, I do read a decent amount. Um, I'm reading a book right now, Big Potential. Um, I've read Team of Teams recently. Uh, by Stanley McChrystal. Um, but you know, books about productivity um, or the or mindset, I think by Carol mm-hmm. Dweck is a really good one. Uh, yeah. Willpower instinct. So these are kind of books that are not necessarily sales related or even not even always business related. It's just how you think, you know, how you process. Um, Daniel Pink uh, wrote some really good ones. Yeah. To sell as human and drive. I think the video mm-hmm. that he, that, that video, you know, the animated video, uh, mm-hmm is maybe the most powerful, like, you know, a little short business video. The, the, Dan, the Dan Pink one. Dan Pink. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, unbelievable. And uh, I, I, lo- I mean, I love the animations, but. Um, All right, yeah. cool. We'll, we'll, we'll start a book club and I'll put some of these links in the, in the comments. I guess I, I, I think so. The way I'm hearing is just keep, keep reading, keep, keep nourishing. I mean, I know that that's cliche to a certain degree, but it's surprising how busy we get and don't have quote, you know, don't have time to, yeah, I mean, look, if you read, if you, you know, if you read 20 pages a day, right, which I don't know, I'm not a fast reader, but you know, I can do that in less than an hour, 30 minutes, you know, you would, you would basically be reading 12 books a year, yeah. right? And so, and if you can do, you know, 20 pages twice a day, right, you 25 books. Um, so I think if you just, you know, you spend a little bit of time on yourself and, you know, for your own development, 
uh, goes a long way. Um, and so as you can see, like I try to, try to read yeah. as much as I can. I mean, you know, if I can do it, uh, I think it's, it's possible. I'm, I'm not, I'm really, I'm not a great reader. I, it takes me a, a while, but you know, it's, it's I, I've learned some powerful things. And award to other people who are heads of sales, you can make the time. Yeah, it's, you can you can certainly make the time. And also, I, I think that besides reading, is if there's one thing salespeople like, it's telling you about what they do, what's made them successful. And so, you can reach out to sales leaders all the time. There's a lot of great networks, um, you know. Or you just, you know, I like I meet with uh, this guy Mike. I used to work with. I go in the city and we have dinner and we just. I mean, you know, we just top it up and we talk about what each other are, are working on, you know, both business and personal life. I think that's a really good way to learn what other salespeople are doing and, and um, how they're having success. Nice. All right. So good now circle back. What other factors, right? We've got the economy, we've got return to office or, or work from home elements. What, what's, what else is keeping hiring managers awake at night? Um, What's keeping hiring managers awake at night? I think the work from home thing is is certainly a, a hot topic. I personally don't think anyone's going to force me or I'm not going to force anybody to go back to an office anytime. I think you know, being able to take my kids to, to school in the morning and be home for dinner is I'm never going to give that up. Um, so I think that's, I, I th but I think hiring managers, what's keeping them home is building a culture uh -huh. uh, remote i think that's that's a challenge and i would be lying if i said that it's the exact same as being in an office it's just yeah. it's different um and so i think that's certainly something that keeps them awake at night and then i, I mean i do think that there's an element of hiring managers that um want to make sure that their salespeople are being productive all the time and you know what are they working on like uh, i don't i don't know what they're doing all day long so I think that stresses them out as well, especially if, you know, their boss is asking them about numbers or asking them about like, hey, what are these salespeople doing? Like, are they are they at their full capacity? Um, I think that that stresses them out as well. And so being in that seat, any tips for things that you've learned to reduce the stress or feel that accountability doesn't have to be a negative four letter word? Yeah. So first thing, whether you're working from home or you're in an office, nobody's working, you know, nobody's going to be 100% like locked in the entire hours. And that's fine. Um, and also, whether you're looking over somebody's shoulder or they're, you know, working in Mexico City, right, in a, in a WeWork, right, it's, they, they'll be able to fake whether they're working hard or not, right? There's, especially in sales. So I think, you know, focusing less on, you know, what they're doing all day long and more just on the outcomes and making sure that they feel like they have everything they need. Uh, it's powerful. Like there's people on my team. I don't know what they're doing all day long. Right. I have no idea what they're doing. And I don't care, but we do meetings, you know, in between the day, we do a two o'clock meeting every single day, training every single day. Um, and, you know, we're available for each other, but outside of that, you know, you got to just trust that, and that you've built, you've built a, uh, you know, a, a culture, a community right. that they're going to, they're going to act on the, you know, they're going to act on, on behalf of the company and what's best for, for us and, and the way that we're going to grow. Yeah. That, that, that's a, that's a tough one to, um, to figure out. Um, yeah. So, okay. So, so combine some of that with your, with your crystal ball and, and prediction for what, what you said, six months, you think things will you know, are we, are you going back to boom times? Are we going to re just remove some of the terror? Is it not a, help me with your particular, you know, um, to prediction on, on the next six months, three to six months. Oh man, don't hold me to this. Um, oh, no, no, don't worry. We'll, 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 we'll have another one of these in six months and laugh about it. <laughs> um, I think this, the next six months is the, the best companies, the best leaders are going to separate themselves from the rest of the pack. So I think there's going to be a lot of companies that aren't going to make it. Um, I think you'll always see layoffs, but I think part of layoffs is the you know conditions of the economy, and the other part is just companies are not operating well. Uh, sometimes both. So I think the best companies, the best leaders, the ones who build the best teams are. Um, what is this? Okay, um, yeah. So I think are are going to be the ones that will have the most opportunity uh, going forward.
Oh, okay. I, I could just continue, I guess. Um, I think, let's see, maybe there's other questions. Maybe we can, some people can ask questions. They be available. Um, anyway, I think though the, uh, the future, you know, the next six months, just to add to kind of what I was saying is I think it will normalize a little bit, um, but the companies that have been operating fine will continue to grow and people will be able to, oh, hey, Jeff, sorry about that. All right, all good. Um, yeah, so I was just giving a, a quick rundown about that the, the best companies will, you know, in the next two to six months will continue to thrive and people will get opportunities there. Um, they will have the best leadership as well, the best process, and they'll have built a system that, you know, people will want to be part of. Uh, you may be on mute or I can't hear you. Yeah, that happens. Okay. Economics wise, it seems like you can find negative or positive information, like most news, I suppose. You know, is right. it going to, is it, you know, are we, are we headed for a recession? Is it going to affect the way that startups run their business? I mean, obviously, if you get a VC funded group, they're going to have different uh, priorities. Yeah, I, just, well, I don't think we're, we're going to see what we've just seen the last two years in, in tech and sales. Right. Again, not, for a while. But does I, that mean it's bad? Um, no, it doesn't mean it's bad. I think it's good. It's uh, like I said, the best companies are going to rise to the top. Um, I, I think it's probably a little bit harder to raise money. Right. Okay. I think some people who gave out money who got burned are going to be a little bit more particular. I think you're going to see companies that aren't going to have as flashy of perks, right? You know, company lunches or trips. Um, but I think that stuff is is nice for people, but it's not. They're nice to have, they're not need to have. I would rather, you know, I would rather have a really supportive, you know, leader, somebody who's going to help me get to the next level um, of my career, than have you know catered lunches every day um, or company trips. So, yeah, so we got a, a big correction. Same as like an 08 where yeah. this guy did fall, but everybody managed to like not die and it was going to be okay. Yeah. I, I'm i seeing, and you touched on this a second ago, so I want to like dig into the culture piece a little bit because nothing's squishier or fluffier or hard to like, you know, really nail down than what culture is and what it means to each individual. Again, everything's subjective within particular teams. But doesn't the return to RTO WFH, right? Like how that balance between whether we're going to, you know, manage people remotely or insist they come back in define a lot of our culture and how are you dealing with uh, that, that culture piece specifically? Like what does it equal? Cause in the past you could sort of slap a, you know, a get together or a happy hour on top of it and say, yeah, we've got great culture. But right. I think that we're realized we're moving into this new phase where people understand that that's not really helpful. Right. Yeah, it's really hard. This is a good question. It's, it's really it's challenging. super hard. Yeah. Right. But I think there's an opportunity here. The opportunity is that the people who are able to build a culture remote are going to be head and shoulders above everyone else. Right. So this is a challenge for sales leaders, for okay. me in particular, right? How the hell do I build a culture remote like I did when I was in person where people, you know, could see me face to face, they could, um, you know, feel the energy, right, in person. How the hell are we going to do that, right? Um, the thing is that when I got hired before before COVID, um, my company was in Michigan and there was four of us in New York. So it was basically remote anyway. So I had to learn there. So I almost got a head start, right? How do I, you know, it's me and three people working in a convene in New York City and I got 40 or 50 people uh, in in Michigan, in Metro Detroit and the and, and like, you know, 10 of them in San Diego. So I had, how do I do this? So um, a couple of things. One is being always available. And, and I know that like kind of counterintuitive, like you do have to have boundaries. But for me, like, I'm available. If you have questions, you Slack me. I can set up a call on my calendar. I, I put blocks in my calendar. Free time, you know, you can schedule whatever you want. Um, I do a one-on-one -on -one with everyone on the team every week, once a week. Two o'clock meeting every single day. I've, now, I've done this for the last five years across three companies. Two o'clock training every single day. Sometimes it's just like on Fridays, we just catch up and shoot the shit and make sure everyone's feeling good. Other times, you know, we do sales tactic. Other times we do industry knowledge, competitor stuff. Um, 
and and I, and then in between they do one off meetings with each other and i think that is a good way to build culture right it's not people like literally sitting in the ki- kitchen of a we work you know sharing a beer um i, I like that too but <laughs> it you know it 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 does show that we are in it together and I, and I've hired people all across the country. There's people on my team that I've literally never met in person before. Um, they don't know if I'm five six or six two, uh, but they know which, that I. Which, which is it? I am yeah, about six two. All right, so, cool. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, but actually, when, when people do end up meeting me in person, they're like, I don't know, you're that actually that tall. I'm like, yeah, well, uh, I guess I'm sitting in a chair all day long. I can, can do whatever, <laughs> whatever you want. Um, but but setting this this uh, is program of trainings and one-on-ones and one-off meetings and some of them we keep it light you know we just talk about the weekend um because it doesn't always have to be productive from a business standpoint i don't always have to ask them about the pipeline i don't always have to ask them about you know what are some common objections you're hearing and let's let's do it I don't, we don't always have to do a role play sometimes mm-hmm. it's just how's everything going what are, what are we, uh, what's everybody like focused on or um, what are some books that you've read or, you know, have you traveled, are you to travel? And people like that. It takes the pressure off. Um, and so that is how I'm building a remote culture. And I, I think I've done a pretty good job over the past, what, three years now, almost four years. So, yeah, so extra effort into touch. Kind of, right. kind of like we all know that if you're doing outbound prospecting, it's better to do personalization and spend the extra time. Right. How do you how how do you plan to scale that? Uh, that's hard. Scaling is hard. I, I I will say that I think a common myth in especially in startups is everything has to scale. Fair. Um, Fair. I think every, you know whether it's a CRM or whatever, like it, it's got to scale. It's got to scale. I think that's that's not right. For me, how do I scale this? I don't know yet, to be honest with you. Um, I do know though if I if I build a culture of people who are who feel like they're all in it together, you know, let's just say I got this team to fifty people, I would be able to, you know, the things that I do, I would have somebody else do. I think, you know, in a the team lead, you know, they do trainings and, and so I do that. So one of the days of the week, I have a person on the team who does the training and they get a little feel for it. Um, they're not a manager. They're not, you know, it's in an official team lead capacity, but they start to get a feel of what it's like to, to, to share their knowledge. And so I think if I needed to scale this thing tomorrow, I would just try to replicate, you know, what I'm, you know, what I do and, uh, and I have tried people play with like, but it's a good question because I don't have the perfect answer on how to build this thing to, a thousand person sales team and, and the infrastructure for that. Yeah. I mean, obviously things move on and get lost as, as you, you abstract yourself from the process and uh, you don't find it. It's like we talk about demonstrating things like finding someone who can actually, you know, follow your model. Right. And you're allowing them to do it their way to a certain degree, right? Nobody's ever going to do things exactly the way we want them to perfectly. Agreed. Crazy to could try although we try <laughs> yeah totally agree so yeah, yeah that's I, that's that's really good so let me loop back good on that subject anything else you want to add no, no i feel good about that that's great uh when we talk about we're talking about people and you know, you're people over everything really like you've got a, this passion for the, the humanistic side totally i totally like love that and agree with it I'm kind of a, a, a personality assessment geek. Anything, okay. anything, any hot take on whether you like them, hate them, anything that you've used, and more importantly, what the value of that is going forward. Like when, if you use something akin to that, even if it's not an official, you know, here, take this assessment and we're going to look at your results. Yeah. Okay. So forever ago, um, I took one of those, right? Because I, I used to be part of a company that was uh, did peer groups for manufacturing company presidents, CEOs, and we had we I took I don't know the uh, I forget which one it was, right? One of the popular ones. I took it and I learned a lot, like a lot about myself. And and then when I was in business school, we did it again. Um, and in you in, know in, in, I hate to be the guy that says like in business school, but um, when I was at Rutgers, there you you meet with people who are all different 
you know, job function, some IT people, some finance people. And so I think the value in these assessments is not just like, what am I, but you learn how to get along with different people, how to motivate them, um, like things that they're not, uh, not as clear. You just think, oh, like this person, they talk a lot. They're, they're an extrovert, right? But they're not, they're, they're introverted. Um, so I think those personality assessments are really good. I do, I do something similar. I actually have never told anybody on my team this, but I do create these profiles for everyone on our team where like, what are they motivated by? Like, what are the most important mm-hmm. things? How do they like to get feedback? And it, it's not like super like, uh, you know, develop like these assessments are, but I try to, and like I said, you know, if I, when I keep small teams, I can interact with them um, and coach them each individually. And it works. So I think there is a lot of merit to these assessments and the way that you motivate, the way that you coach uh, according to their profile. Yeah. Interesting. And then how would you, how do you leverage that to call it a data driven approach to culture? How do you leverage that down there? Do you look at your profile with report? Is it this kind of thing where you say, hey, Jake, look, I know that you hate doing this. But it's part of the job, and I know we'll and we'll balance it out with that later. Yeah, and I was talking to, to a couple of weeks ago with um, Dr. Julie Pham, who talks a lot about curiosity and respect, and she was you know very clear that you know we obviously take things from our point of view and filter it. So like a lot of times when we're giving direction as right. a manager or a director, it's like it can come across as like yeah. insulting, even though it's not intended that way. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're 100 percent right. Um, I I'm guilty of that. I sometimes when I get feedback, I take it personally, or I I feel like they don't understand where I'm coming from, or like you know how hard I'm working, or, or um, so I'm certainly guilty of that. Um, but I think as far as giving people personality or these assessments, I think I do a variation of that. Is I just ask them, how do you like to be motivated? How do you like to be coached? What's important to you? Like, how do you want me to support you? Um, Sarah, who we promoted a couple of months back, one thing that she does really well is she tells me exactly what she needs from me, how I should be supporting her. I think that's very bold of her. That's great. And I think it's crazy when you say like a salesperson selling their sales leader, like what to do. But that's what, that's what, that's the community and the culture that we've built. Like, no problem. I have no, you tell me exactly what you want. That's better for me because you're going to produce at a high level. You're going to feel good. You're going to feel encouraged. Um, I think people are kind of taken back by that sometimes, but um, you know, look, if I, if I want to figure out the best way to, to train the team, I ask them for topics, right? I want to find out like, you know, where do you want to be in the come or, you know, wh- where, what the next level is for, for Sarah. She tells me, I want to be this, you know, I want to work towards this. And so if you can create like an open form of communication, um, that's the best way to do it. Well, you, we're talking about with salespeople as well, right? So what's the number one thing that we love to do is read minds. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. I already know how to sell this this prospect because I've already right. figured out what they want as opposed to this process you just described only, you know, on the on the outside of like, how do we really uncover what they care about? Can you tell right. people? So so you, you got a, a win-win there because you're telling people internally, hey, right. here's how I, I want to run our business. You probably will understand that intrinsically when you talk to a prospect. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I think the best way to find out something about the person is to ask. Right. So yeah, we do like to read mine. Yeah. (laughs) It's a, it's a crazy thing. Like, I mean, you know, there's different levels that you can't make a cold call and I can't call you. Hey Jeff, uh, this is Jake or Uh, What is your, what what keeps you up at night? What are your biggest challenges? You're going to be like, well, like, what is this? But um, I, I it think might be refreshing, like, actually. I mean, yeah. you're like, well, actually, you know, it all started. I'm not, I'm now I'm not in a 15 point uh, sequence anymore. This is great. Yeah. Like, <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. You promised to stop calling me. Um, but but I, I really think like you don't need to read minds. I mean, you can anticipate. I, I teach something called anticipatory selling where you can anticipate things based on what you're hearing. But, you know, the best way to ask or the best way to find out is just to ask. And I think, you know, coaching is no different. Um you know, how am I doing? You know, how, uh, how am I, how am I supporting you? I actually asked it on interviews. I go, how am I doing so far? And they're like, what, what, the, what are you talking about? I mean, what do you mean? How are you doing? Like, how am I doing? Um, I think like it catches people off guard, but it really, it just gets to the core of what we want. Um, 
and you know it sifts through all the the bs interesting okay so how what do you what's the what's the future for AccuCo? where are you guys headed in the next 18 months up eating the world <laughs> yeah um i think what's made us successful uh in the past and up until now is we're disciplined so the way that we acquire businesses is very thorough we involve many people um, i think when we make decisions we do that together um, we're very data driven as well and i think in our space a lot of our competitors try to move really fast and i, I do respect the idea of moving fast and breaking stuff and failing fast but I think when you when you lack discipline, you get in trouble. And so I think Akiko has been very meticulous about our growth. And like I said, we hire really smart people. So I think we're we're chugging along, and I think we're growing. Um, we're looking to acquire brands, but only if they fit into our criteria. Um, and then we think we can operate them. We're operating our brands really well. We had an excellent Prime Day, and uh, I'm looking to add people to the sales team today or yesterday I'm, I'm hiring. Um, I met somebody that can help you with that. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Go well, ahead. So something I think is really, really important. So, you know, when we're talking to the, the world at large, you're, you seem to be describing, and you don't have to answer this, but you seem to be describing a situation where Akiko is sort of steaming through these choppy waters in a way that it, you're not really affected and you're able to hire if need be, you're able to grow. Maybe it's not the same same plan that you had six nine months ago talk a little bit about you know a the fact that it's a thing that companies actually do because word in the street is everybody's going out of business and everybody's getting fired and right. we're going to be living in in caves soon yeah and b you know how are you doing it um, Data. we are facing challenges that like everybody else i, I want i don't want to paint the picture of everything's perfect um it's been hard but i think being transparent has, has been helpful um, and I think being, like I said, just, you know, being not slow, but methodical mm -hmm. is, is the way to do it. Um, I've been, I've, I haven't, I don't want people on my team to think that I'm being naive and every day saying like, Hey, um, you know, it's all good. Like we're <laughs> killing it. Um, so I'm, I'm open and I'm honest with them and, um, and I think that helps. And you know, there's nothing scary than not hearing anything. And then you know, all of a sudden you get a meeting on your calendar, you know, a quick touch base, and that's it for you. So I've I've been open, I've been honest with people. I, I understand that um, you know, people are, you know, they're people above everything, they're not employees. And and across the company, I think we've we've done a, a good job of just saying, like, you know, let's not feel like too impacted by what's happening outside of us, our competitors and not getting too focused on that. Like we have a plan. We're very clear on it. Let's stick to that. And, and that's allowed us to, to survive. Do the Amazon layoffs that have been announced affect you guys in any way? No. Um, they I mean, maybe if, you know, we potentially want to hire people with Amazon experience, I think that would be powerful, but um no, because Amazon, you know, the, the whole marketplace is massive. And so there's still lots of opportunity for us. Um, I think that has been like outside of their, um, I think, it, I, don't, I don't know where all the layoffs are coming from in, in Amazon, but um, I think for, you know, the marketplace, there's still steady growth for us. Yeah. Well, a lot of it's in Alexa and Echo um, and word right. in the street you know, we're out in Seattle is, is that, you know, a lot of it will be redistributed internally anyway. Okay. So maybe not as much of a sky is falling type of thing, but it's the news. And so it affects the way people make decisions. Yeah. I, I think um, if I can just add a quick insight on this is that I think for the next six months or the next, the future is people may not be as excited about going to work for these big companies that they viewed as safe. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like it's like, the, the big companies are safe. The startups are risky, you know, and people, you know, thought like you go, you go work for Facebook or whatever, Amazon. It's like, you're just going to, like, you're going to be fine. So I think that will adjust some of the top talent and where they look and the companies that they choose mm -hmm. to work at next. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. It's sort of a little bit of a flip flop, I guess. 
because if you, you and that again oper, opens opportunities for startups, right? Because they're like you can't. It's not no longer as risky or not as the, the, the gap yeah. isn't as wide. Right. It, it's there. It's all risk, right? Every every place has an element of risk, and um, you know it, maybe instead of buying into the company, you're going to buy into the leadership. Right. Um, buy into like how you'll be supported and, and th that's like what i was saying earlier is why i think this is an opportunity for the best sales leaders or the best leaders in general to stick out because it's all a risk and people will start buying into people more than than the company and hey you know this this is the next unicorn or this is the next company that's going to ipo it's like yeah. this is the sales leader that's going to help me get to the next level of my career and i'm, I'm trying to that's you know what i'm trying to do and, and every day I, I try to bring that I love that. And I, I love your approach of, you know, letting people know up front, it's half about me, half about you. Yeah. Got, have another favorite interview question that you love have, or alternately have an interview question that you hear other people use that you just hate. Uh, an interview question like that I ask or that somebody asks me. Either one, either one. Um, I hate when people ask me what the company is going to be like in five years. Uh, I hate when people ask me right away, you know, how much money can I make? I can't stand that. Um, I hate when sales leaders or salespeople uh, interrogate people. So they ask them, like, how would you handle this objection? Or, you know, how would you, or, or like, you know, tell me about your quota, like average deal size. I think you should ask that stuff and it's important, but not right now, right off the bat, mm -hmm. right? Because I don't care about what you did in your previous role as much as what you can do here. So yeah, like, oh, you close all these logos and tell me about it. Like, I think that's fine if you're trying to learn about the process, but if you're just trying to qualify them and make sure that they're not lying, um, I think I think that's wrong. Um, questions that I do like is, I like to ask them like, what are you an expert in? And like, for me, like I'm, my new like side project is woodworking. And okay. so I'm not, an ex I'm not an expert in it, but if somebody asked me about woodworking, I can, they could tell how like curious I am and how excited I get about learning new things. And so if I ask somebody, you know, what are you, you know, what are you an expert in or what are you aspiring to be an expert in? They'll tell me. And um, I think that translates really well to business because, you know, if you're generally curious outside of work, you're probably curious inside of work. Awesome. Yeah. I love that. So good, good, good tips for people on both sides of the interview uh, coin to, to uh, make it as, as good a possible, uh, good experience as possible, I think. Uh, okay, last little bit. Let, we're gonna close that here. We've talked about sort of the crystal ball for the next six to eighteen months. What, what are we? What's happening at the end of the year in Q one? Are we just, you know, like what, what's the what's the short term look like? Uh, Tell, and, I'd, and I'd love to hear any reason not to freak out, but it's yeah. okay to tell everybody it's just gonna freak out. Uh, I, I would say don't get too caught up in uh, all the layoffs. I think look for the opportunities. There are companies that are thriving right now. Um, I think there's smaller companies, agencies, companies that are you know under 10 million. They're doing amazing right now. It's because they have to, right? They're bootstrapped. Right. They, they didn't go out and raise money. They had to be disciplined. They had to run lean. Um, they're run well. Uh, there's people I'm connected to that are you know, hit me up all the time when they're hiring. So I would say that there is some optimism the next three months, Q1 of next year. There are a lot of companies. You just have to find them and, you know, connect with them that, that are hiring. They want salespeople and they want customer success people and they're out there. So I would say, you know, the next three, six months, you're going to see some news, some really, you know, bad news and, you know, sad stuff. Um, you know, you don't get too impacted by that because I, I really am optimistic about a lot, you know, some small, some smaller companies that, I mean, I personally know. And so I, that's, that's the world I live in um, that are hiring. They're looking for people. So if you're looking for a job, you know, you can connect with them. And I, and I, I do think you could get, you know, an opportunity pretty quick. Awesome. Yeah. I'm going to stick your LinkedIn up here. Is that okay? And, yeah, of uh, course. Please. Connect with, with uh, Jake and, and uh, he has great content. Definitely, re, re, you know, advise following him and, and seeing who he's connected to. It's uh, it's always enlightening. Anything else you want to want to throw in there? Should share, should salespeople learn about Amazon? Come talk to you. Yeah, if you want to learn about Amazon, come talk to me. I also um, I do reserve some of my time for people. If you want to 
role play or you want to get prepared for interviews. I can't say everyone, you know, will interview you like me, but I can offer my perspective. I've interviewed hundreds of people or really thousands of people. Um, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of my ability to help people. So if you want, message me. Um, you know, there's my LinkedIn. I'm pretty, I try to be as available as possible. And I, I really believe we're all in it together. So if I can help out in any way, whether it's at Akiko or just in general, maybe I can connect you to people. Um, I'm not just saying that. I can't just say people over everything, but not actually do it. So, um, you know. I can, I can attest, you, you, you demonstrate what you say. Yeah, uh, I try. Best, best LinkedIn network people I've known. I, pre I appreciate that. And then uh, uh, above all, Jeff, I appreciate you having me on. I really enjoyed this. Um, I, I was, I'm really excited. I prepared for this, so hopefully this was valuable. It was incredible. I, I appreciate your insight. Appreciate you spending some time. Hey, you're still on the hook for coming back in six months and seeing whether your predictions are right. Well, if they're right, I'll come back on. If they're wrong, I'll just go. Hide we'll, go somewhere, <laughs> we'll just but... have a a, a a a picture of you, and we'll talk about it. Yeah, exactly. I appreciate. It. We'll just if if I'm wrong, we'll just wipe this off the internet. That's right. Wait, wait, yeah, it's a digital world. We'll just remove it. Exactly. All right. I, appreciate I really it. appreciate it. Thanks, man. Have a good one. Okay. Thanks. I appreciate it.